Hi guys, how's it going? Uh, my name's Alan White. Uh, so I have a background in design and interaction design. Um, and I, I would consider myself uh, just a dabbler. You know, I'm, I, I dabble in a lot of different things. And um, SAS is one of those things that just, you know, solved a lot of problems for me whenever I would do web work. So it drew me in. And one of the things that excited me right from the get-go, probably the top drawer feature for me, was its ability, its mastery of color. And just a lot all over color. CSS, it's like, you know, find, dig up that decimal. <laughs> Some of you guys, you, you hardcore programmers, can probably actually do that. Um, but uh, I'm not one of those people. So uh, it's really nice. It was really nice to me uh, for me to, to kind of uncover what SAS could do. And it's also nice to see how it's evolved over time. Not only the core sort of SAS functions for transforming color, which, you know, most of you guys probably already know and use all the time. So this, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I made this talk, I assembled this with that assumption that most of you guys already do a lot of this. Here are some thoughts and observations that I have. Um, and I'm going to start with those observations coming from the, the place of being an artist. I'm, I'm a third generation uh, artist and, uh, you know, I have a design degree, but my, my, one of my first loves was painting and color theory was one of the things that I really latched onto in college that I enjoyed immensely. And uh, it really helped me make sense of and give me a structure and a model for, um, you know, creating visual beauty and, and things that worked, um, especially, you know, within given cultures. So uh, I'll, I'll just kind of go through a quick history of color. Maybe some of you guys have had that. In the 18th century, this, this one guy, um, Runge, I'm guessing, because he's, uh, he's, a, he's a German fellow, he kind of came up with this ball idea. He's like, OK, if lights are at the top of this construct, you know, this is pretty cool for the 18th century, I have to say. The, you know, he didn't have you know, AutoCAD to generate this image. He, he kind of just mentally came up with this. Uh, he, you know, lights at the dark. Lights at the top, darks at the bottom, and then hues running around the circle. He was kind of the first guy to really illustrate this. So I, I think that's way cool. It's even got the old uh, scripty type there. Um, before, you know, Max, Max and Prepress and all that stuff. Good, good things. So, so he really, he, I think really when you, if you go through the, a tour of art history, you know, you really start to see the Enlightenment collide with, you know, what used to be a lot more intuitive, you know, and things like that where, they're starting to, we're, they're trying to make sense of the world. And artists are trying to, maybe, you know, they're creating, we're, you know, think great thinkers are creating models for everything else in our world, so why not make models for color too? It, color is really interesting that way, in that, yes, like we know, and we'll get into the science of this here in a second. Uh, just real quick, this is, this is kind of a more, um, a, a more detailed model of what this image was. So you see at the top you have yellow, down in the lower left you have a bigger diamond, orange red, and then over there violet blue. So basically red, yellow, blue. Uh, yeah. Or so the dominant color model of, hey, if you mix those three colors, you can get everywhere color wise. Okay, then this guy came on the scene in the early 1900s, Albert Munsell. And he really tried, he got down and dirty with color theory. He, this is really the guy, this is, Munsell is what I was taught in school in, in the early 90s. Um, and so uh, it's interesting how the science and art of color has kind of progressed since then, but he's still really referred to. And what's interesting to me is, and you'll see in some of the examples that we get to, some of the, some of the SAS um, and uh, other code libraries being built around managing color, still refer back to that model, that painterly model that, that isn't even, you know, really current science. So anyway, Munsell came up with some, a lot of ideas, and you can kind of see this where, you remember that ball that we had, where we had whites at the top, blacks at the bottom, hue running around the outside. As you, as you go through these slices here, the slices of the blue-purple pizza, I'm thinking about the pizza on its way, uh, you go from maximum saturation out here to minimum in the beginning, in the, in the middle. And that's called chroma. So you have value, light and dark. Here's that model right there. You got value, light and dark, chroma, in and out, and then hue, round circle. Okay. 
Now here's kind of what Munsell's wheel looks like. And it's a little different. You don't have yellow, red, and blue in those perfect tri equilateral triangular positions anymore. He's kind of got some other way. And he's, he based his on observation. The thing about color that's interesting, and if I look around the room, I could probably even come up with some examples, but color exists when we perceive it. It exists in relationship to other colors. That's why when the sun is setting over Portland and the sky is kind of orange, it, that's why the hills look aqua blue. It's kind of weird. Or they might shift kind of purple. They, like, for example, when you put, like if I was to take that green banner over there, and throw a red chip on it, the green itself pushes that red in a certain direction. It pushes it in its complementary, that is, its opposite direction. And so it, it's, it's just a funky thing about color, and it's really, it really has to do with the way our minds perceive color. So Munsell really tried to dig into that. Munsell really tried to di dive into color and kind of understand a little more about how humans perceive color, not just like what is the, maybe the mathematical representation of it. He didn't even have the tools that we have now to actually measure optical color like a colorimeter. Okay, so here is, here is that uh, sort of um, uh, mechanical overlay around that that's got a little more detail. Um, and some of these are, there's links uh, within the slide deck if you ever want to dig into this. No, Alan, I've seen quite enough today. Thank you. So today we have a, a more current model. C-Lab is one that you've seen in Photoshop. C-Lab's kind of cool. Um, I used to use it. It's, it's nice for when... Um, I've been using Photoshop way too long. But it's nice when you want to play with the luminance values in an image without um, shifting the color around. Because if you take an RGB image and you crank up the luminance, like you, you know, overexpose it basically, some of those saturation values are going to really spike in certain areas. So C-Lab has been handy, like, oh, I want to lighten it without making the guy's skin yellow or orange. Anyway, that's, that's where C we might have seen C-Lab in our in our day-to-day -day lives. So here's that color space, and it's a little bit different. Uh, in fact, um, let's see, I don't exactly know how it's different. I didn't really look into it, but it's become, it's, you know, slight adjustments based on new science, based on you know, observations and other, you know, other criteria. Now, we, you know, we've also got, you know, things like the Pantone color guide. That's really great. You know, that's, if you're a print designer, you kind of, that's, that's in your back pocket all the time. You've got to have one of them swatch books. And they, they say, oh, you got to buy it every year, and it's a couple hundred bucks or something. I was like, oh, man, that's so expensive. Just to, just to get the color swatch right. But people care about that when you're printing, you know, 10,000 of them. Um, one quick thing to, to consider before we move on is that some of you may have heard of this in, in school or whatever, but there's additive color and there's subtractive color. Paint and pigment is subtractive color. When you mix it together, it gets darker. It gets muddier. You know, it doesn't go to black, but it goes to brown. It, you, when you add stuff to it, it's additive is really what you guys, what we all work in day to day. So that is when, if you took a red, green, and blue spotlight, like get those cool LED cans and play with those, put those on, oops, Mike doesn't do that, point those all at the same spot and you'll get white. If, if they're real chromatic, you know, chromatically pure, you'll get white. That is additive color. And that is essentially what we work with. We, we're, right here, we're looking at additive color. So we're looking at uh, the projector. It's got red, green, and blue. Um, you know, uh, uh, crystals in it, and it's basically making that image by piling the light on top of each other. So that's something to keep in mind when you get into color transformations is you're dealing with an additive model. Okay, so this is just my beef. It's not a beef, but it's just something to think about. Like, I don't think anything I'm going to say here today is really going to just like, oh man, I got to go change all my color transforms or, or, or all my color libraries or whatever because it's totally wrong. <laughs> it's not that, but it's something to be aware of. Because what Munsell was trying to say was, look, our brains perceive color in certain ways, and certain things really pop for us humans. You know, like that sunset I was talking about. You know, or I was—I remember this spring. I was—I was doing a bunch. I'll show you some color chips later if you want. But uh, I was—I was building. I was working on a site, and I was doing this exact process. I was like, okay, this is a brand new brand. I don't. Nobody knows what it needs to look like. They've given me complete freedom. So what color themes do, do I need to go dig up? And it was spring, and everywhere I looked was this exploding yellow greens, all the fresh leaves, all the growth. And I would look at the sky, and the sky was just like this, this, this sort of grayish purple almost. It's like the green was pushing the sky purple, which is crazy to think about. But that's the, that was the vibe I was getting, you know? And so that, that color vibe exists because of what Munsell was trying to describe. 
So here's what I'm saying about the RGB problem. You guys recognize that ball. It's, it's the ball that we get in our color pickers. Well, it's got, at the top, it's got those three phosphors, you know, green, red, and, uh, and blue. And so because of the limitations of the technology that we have, you know, which is red, green, and blue phosphors and LEDs, that's, that, that's how our color ball ended up like this. And as you can see here, if you compare it to the, the C-Lab space, which is a little more accurate, there's a big difference between what those color hues, these, you can tell, those color wheels are not the same. And they, it's not just that it's spun a little bit, like blue is only spun a tiny bit, yellow is a lot, red is a little more. So the way we, this, is, this is what I'm showing you here is, this is how humans perceive color, and this is the color model that works for humans, but this is what our computers want to give us. And so as you do this, it's as, as you guys work with color and you, you create color schemes, and even the, the great tools that are out there like Cooler, which I'm a huge fan of. Here's a bunch of swatches that I picked. I have a really hard time getting off blue and yellow. I don't know what my deal is. But like my brain, like if you look at my paintings from college and even the websites I've built, like nobody ever got fired for picking blue, right? Old IBM quote. Um, so I have to like really work at adding other colors <laughs> I don't know why, but just, you know, it's a safe place, and you just, you just kind of go there. But uh, here's a bunch of ones. Like, there's, let's see if my spring one is in here somewhere. Uh, eh, I don't see it, but, you know, I, I saw a lot of yellow. I thought, oh, what, a, what about a monochromatic one? That would be really cool. And uh, some other ones. Now, I did one just now. Let's see. I don't think it's, no, this is a slide. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my mind. Uh, I, I just found the Adobe Cooler app, and I have to say this thing is way cool. Because um, if you've ever used it, like it takes a picture, and and uh, it gets these three little dots. It gets these five little dots. Look how it's. You see how it's tracking? Like check this out. Like I'll go over here and say, hey, pick a case. What you see here is that that color scheme. This is so, this is sort of a triadic color scheme. Where a triadic, you know, it's a three. It's like a tricycle. Where I've got one, two, three spikes, and I pulled this one way down and made this nice kind of tan color. But it's the tan is it's like its complement is over here, like blue purple. It's opposite. So there, there's like a there's like a package. There's like a list of, of different kinds of schemes, and these are the ones that I learned in school: analogous, monochromatic, triadic, complementary. You know, I'm gonna skip this stuff because I haven't even gotten to my demo. So you guys can shut me up, man. I tried to go to keep it short. Anyway, those the, that this is a great way to explore color, and I love the way it helps you. You know. Because it kind of gives you these guides, gives you these frameworks for exploring color themes that are harmonious, that, that do work uh, optically. My beef with the RGB thing is that we need to be aware of that. And, and just, you know, it's great stuff to learn. Learn about great painters and what they did and why what they did worked. Um, that Cooler app is too cool because, I, I, it, you, like, I just did it over there and it sent it right to my, to my account and everything. That was just the bomb. So style tiles. Who has any any of you guys ever used, built style tiles? Used them? Okay, you guys are down with this. Um, I, I I haven't really had the opportunity to do a ton of them, but you know it has come up, and so I thought you know I need to I need to get into this a little bit more. And so what I was what I just threw together like in a day was uh, a, a really quick style tile found uh, framework based. You know, so I got foundation. I've been using a lot of doing a lot of foundation stuff. And uh, I love how you can, like, they, they do, in Foundation, they actually do a fair bit, they do a fair bit intelligently with SAS color functions, um, some of that stuff. Like, there, there's one bit I'll show you later that's actually got some logic in it. Like, if the color of the panel is darker than 50%, then it inverts the colors on the front. I love that kind of thing. All that kind of stuff that builds in elegance into a color system that then when you're ready to go do your prototyping or whatever, it's like, oh, ready to go. So really quickly, uh, every vector, all every not, let's see, this is almost all fonts, by the way. So like this thing and that thing and my custom logo, icomoon.io, that thing is amazing. Like I've, I've got, I can, I can throw vector uh, artwork up there now. And then I can also theme. Boom, I changed my colors. Let's say I had a color system in there where there's, I pulled this off my cooler one and it, it went so I just kind of threw these together. But here's another one. Here's the tan one we were just looking at that had the tan in it pretty easy. And here's an inverted one. You know, so the, the cool thing is it's and you this isn't anything revolutionary for you guys, but what is cool about 
about um, some of the way that that was that that can be managed. And I, I really didn't go deep enough. But what is nice is with foundation and other libraries, at least if, like these are very relatively simple color themes. A key and a complement, and then it 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 sort of picks off. Oh, the several the, here's several shades of blue. Here's two shades of the dark one right there, and then it just does its thing. Some of those functions that you guys might have seen: adjust hue, saturate, desaturate, lighten. You can pipe. You can do all kinds of math. It'll it'll work in the RGBA space, which is really great too. Yeah, that much. Now here's here's my favorite one, and that's adjust color. Adjust color is really cool because uh, it it lets you. Um, play with any of those. You can play with hue, lightness, value. Um, you can you can change the alpha. You can mix the colors together, and that's just what the native stuff does. I'm seeing all you know now that I've really kind of got my head up and looking into this stuff. You know, there's you know bourbon mix-ins for this. I'll show you some other ones that I found on this way. Basically, there's people who have done this exact thing way 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 deeper and better than me. But I didn't have time to kind of go get my head around it. So anyway, I, I, I'm a big fan of Foundation and how they do it. They don't go all the way, though. Like if I look in their settings files, there's basically anywhere you see the pound sign means that they've arbitrarily typed in you know, a color value. And so my, my approach would be, hey, hook all that to some kind of theming engine and, and get that in there. And here, here you can kind of see, like I've created my own list, theme color blank, whatever that is. And so like you see this, see these are just color ones there? Like, I, they're all just coming. They're all just spinning off of that primary color. So I'm I'm tweaking the the lightness and saturation. What would be even neater is to take Adobe Cooler's models that you see listed, like split complement, analogous, um, triadic, and and actually build those because you can rotate hues and things like that. So we could totally duplicate that approach, and and that way you just pipe in the color, the main colors you want, you know, whatever. Anyway, so there, there's a lot of potential for that, and and really, I think this whole thing could be refined. You know, I, I mentioned the way uh, foundation, um, the way that they they have some logic in here. Like uh, basically, let's see, where is it? Yeah, if the lightness is greater than 50% and the background is something, then look, these guys get a certain color set. If it's not, then then it, you know. So that way that you, that way when you darken something arbitrarily, and I didn't have that, I didn't have this build. I would have loved to clone this and and mess with that. Uh, that way, when you theme it, oh, and you throw the dark colors in there, it all still works, and it still looks good, and you can kind of define how that works, and you can kind of see how that goes. Okay, so hey, so this is the one that's basically, you know, it, it, it builds on the back, Micah, of what you were talking about with Grunt. So I haven't really gotten my head around Grunt and Yeoman yet. Um, probably someday, uh, you know, I'll get to that. But they, they've really done a lot of this work already, and they're part of one of their libraries of team Team Sasses is their color schemer, which works the same way. They, they're going back to that painterly, you know, red, yellow, blue model, that, that, that 18th century model, which is a little weird, but there's something to that. And, and I think I think what they're doing is an important step forward, in, in that they're take, they're accommodating, I guess, human centric models of of how how color works for us as people, and and building that into these systems, which is really, really cool. So I, I would love to, at some point, install those and, and see how you know style tiles can be made just fast as anything, but also really, really powerful and flexible in, in the dimension of color. Any questions? Two and on the color. It's good. OK. Well, you can pull up these uh, this deck uh, elsewhere. And I'm Alan White.